so we continue with the lecture on seizures and epilepsy i think i stopped in the clinical features of a generalized tonic clonic seizure so in a tonic clonic seizure generalized you first have a aura which may be present it may not be present this will be followed by a, a tonic phase along with unconsciousness where the person becomes rigid the all muscles contract and remain like that for about more not more than 30 seconds and during that time because the person loses his consciousness they fall down whatever activity they have been doing they will fall and injure themselves the breathing stops and because there is lack of respiration the person also develops central cyanosis after that short period of few seconds around 30 seconds you will find that the person's contractions relaxes and they go into a clonic phase that is the jerky movements and that will last for up to about two minutes this is followed by the stage of flaccidity when the muscles totally relax the person's level of consciousness remains unchanged and from that they gradually recover during the phase of the tonic clonic phases there might be injuries one is by fall the other one is by tongue bite there might be urinary incontinence and once the person recovers they feel very weak aches in the body and they usually will not remember what has happened during that period of time except for the pain due to the injuries so that is the typical picture and this happens so fast that anybody waiting nearby are usually more scared than helpful these are other variants of generalized seizures first the most important is the generalized tonic clonic seizure and these are the other variants of generalized seizure that means the activity the neuronal activity is generalized from the beginning then we call them generalized in the absence seizure which was earlier known as petit mal you always find it in children the attacks may last for around very briefly a few seconds and the number of frequencies may be 20 to 30 per day we had already discussed this in the previous class then there is myoclonic seizure a tonic seizure then tonic seizures myoclonic is simply myoclonus a tonic is involving brief loss of muscle tone which may lead to fall because the muscles become totally flaccid it may be associated with loss of consciousness or even without the loss of consciousness these people may tend to fall there might be tonic seizures or they may be only isolated tonic seizures the clonic seizure is similar to a generalized tonic clonic seizure but the preceding tonic component will not be there that means the initial few seconds of the the whole body contraction will not be there but the clonic phase will continue so these are some of the other variants of a generalized seizure this is the third variety epileptic spasms it's unusual in adult and it signify widespread cortical damage that means they would be associated gross neurological disturbance in the person or the child and takes the form of marked contraction of the axial musculature lasting as short as a second but may be occurring in clusters of 5 to 50 often on awakening now the trigger factors for the seizures what might precipitate a seizure a person who is prone to seizure may develop a seizure due to certain reasons one is sleep deprivation then if the person misses the dose of the anti-epileptic drug this is very important a person on epileptic drugs should take the drug every day should not miss a single dose if they miss the dose there would be epileptic seizures another important thing is if the drug has been started when the child was young and as it grows older the weight also increases so the requirement of perk of the doses also increases but if the 
child keeps on continuing the same dose which was prescribed at the age of 10 and it has attained the age of 15 naturally the doses is inadequate so that is another reason when you get this sort of a withdrawal seizures although the person has been taking on the medication this is also another important thing which has to be inquired then alcohol if a person with seizures has been taking alcohol and suddenly he or she has withdrawn the alcohol then epileptic seizures may come in any of the hallucinating drugs if they are used physical or mental exhaustion and sitting in front of a TV or a computer screen where the generalized epilepsies can occur or they might be precipitated then any alteration in the nervous system functioning as a result of infections like uh, meningitis or encephalitis or due to some metabolic disturbances like altered electrolytes hypoglycemia uremia so any of these may precipitate and sometimes these are provoked by other sensory stimuli like a loud noise music reading which will be a visual or tactile if the person goes for a hot bath then also it might be precipitated these are not very common so these could be some of the precipitating factors for any seizure now the investigations investigations for any type of seizures and epilepsy we basically divide them into two groups one is what are you going to do to a person who has come with only one episode of seizure and the other one who has come with two or more unprovoked seizures so coming with two or more unprovoked seizure is epilepsy coming with a single seizure may not be epilepsy at all so what are the things that you should do in these particular people a 12 lead ECG has to be done in all these patients that is to exclude syncope syncope is loss of transient loss of consciousness due to a cardiac cause so if you do an ECG and the ECG is absolutely normal then the chances of a syncope leading to transient loss of consciousness is rare so this has to be done invariably if seizure is suspected or it is definite then you have to do a neuroimaging of the head either a CT scan or an MRI to find out whether there are any structural abnormalities which might lead to these seizures then you have to know what is the recurrence chance after a single seizure the recurrence rate after the first episode is about 40 percent and most recurrent attacks occurs within the first two months of the first seizure so if a person had a seizure episode on a particular day and he has come to you after about six months you have done the baseline investigations and found that there is nothing abnormal then the chances that he or she will have another episode is quite remote if it was there the chances were there they would have developed almost within the first month and seizures are less likely if an identified trigger can be avoided the other in fact investigations that you have to do are for infective causes for toxic and metabolic causes which are as appropriate infective causes like for central nervous system infection we'll come to that a little bit later toxic and also metabolic abnormalities in all these individuals immediately after a seizure a EEG should be performed if the EEG shows focal abnormalities the chances of it being a seizure is very high and if it is normal you can go either way it could be have been a seizure or it is not a seizure but getting a positive finding in an EEG will go in favor of a seizure and epilepsy now the investigations for two or more seizures unprovoked that means what investigations you will do when you are suspecting epilepsy not just one seizure you continue with the same investigations that you had would have done for seizure together with that a easy must be done 
investigation should be repeated once again if the epilepsy is intractable to treatment and you should also be aware that between the episodes of seizures the eeg can be abnormal in only about 50% therefore it cannot be used as an investigation to exclude epilepsy so if you find that the eeg done in between two attacks of epilepsy is normal that does not mean that the person was not having a seizure due to epilepsy because the chances of a persistent abnormal eeg is only about 50% you can increase the sensitivity to detect epilepsy by an easy eeg by increasing the recording time by including natural or drug induced sleep because during sleep if it occurs it is very likely to be epilepsy but nevertheless a history is much superior to getting it done by an eeg there are other means of eegs one is ambulatory eeg like the ambulatory ecg you do for cardiology or a video eeg which are helpful to differentiate epilepsy from other disorders neuroimaging like ct scan and mri cannot make a diagnosis of epilepsy because if you find a brain lesion that does not always mean that a person is having a epilepsy due to the brain lesion but presence of a abnormal neuroimage can give you some idea that there are structural lesions or there are no such structural lesions in the head then what is the next thing for investigation try to find out the site of the origin where it has arisen this can be done by a uh, provoked ecg eeg is like a standing eeg or sleep eeg or eeg with electrodes placed at different parts to find out the etiology of the e epilepsy one has to do a mri or a ct scan for ruling out structural lesions for metabolic which i just discussed a little while ago you can do a urea and creatinine to find out any any renal abnormalities are there or uremia electrolytes hyponatremia or hypocalcemia hypomagnesemia so these have to be ruled out liver function test should be done to rule out chronic liver disease and blood glucose should be estimated to find out whether the person has got hypoglycemia causing the epilepsy other inflammatory and infective disorders have to be excluded by doing a complete blood count a esr and crp if these are raised we know that the person has got an inflammation a chest x ray can rule out chest infections including tuberculosis serology for hiv and syphilis and for collagen vascular diseases like sld and ultimately you have to do a csf analysis to find out whether there is central nervous system inflammation either due to a uh, inflammatory disorder or due to a inflammatory infective disorder then finally whether the seizure is an epilepsy or is it a pseudo seizure for that you have to do a long tracing of the eeg either an ambulatory eeg or video telemetry by which you can make out during the convulsion what was the eeg pattern so from that you can make out whether it was a pseudo seizure or it is actually a seizure in all patients coming with a diagnosis of suspected epilepsy we do not go for a ct scan or an mri in which of these we will go for a neuroimaging one is if the child is more than 16 years the reason being in a adolescent or in a adult the chances of secondary epilepsy is quite common in contrast to idiopathic epilepsy in children seizures having a focal feature because focal seizures are more likely to be secondary than primary if the eeg itself shows that there is a focal nature of the seizure then you have to do a imaging to rule out any structural abnormalities in that particular part of the brain and if the seizure cannot be controlled 
adequately with standard drugs, then you have to go for neuroimaging with an idea that other forms of treatment may be necessary, like surgery. What are the management options in a patient with seizures? First is the immediate care, what you are going to do or what the attendant is going to do when a person has got a epilepsy, has developed an attack. Then certain lifestyle advices or avoidances, then the specific anti-epileptic drugs which will prevent recurrences of the disease. Together with that, one has to monitor the treatment if none of these response. You have to take a help of surgeries. Having said that, the third or the sixth option is if the person is responding well, no seizures, can we stop the drug? How to withdraw? So these are the six headings under which you plan out the management of a person having epilepsy. Other than that, there are certain other issues which one has to deal with in epilepsy, with pregnancy, reproduction and in the elderly. Now let us go to these steps one by one. Immediate care. Immediate care, you can't do much. I think I have just covered up this part. Immediate care, you cannot do much. The only important thing that you have to do is do not insert anything inside the mouth, either a spoon or a pair of socks. These are quite commonly done. This will do more injury because by the time the person can be seen by an any individual, he or she has already gone through the phases of tongue bite because that is the first step that has occurred. Now the second component is your lifestyle. What type of lifestyle changes that you would advise in these people? See, uh, epilepsy may develop suddenly during the wakeful phase or during sleep and that might totally incapacitate the individual and chances of injury. So these people should avoid doing any activity where unconsciousness for a duration of time may lead to serious injuries or fatality. So what are those instances which may lead to instant injury or death in any individual. Let us just think of those areas. If you are climbing a tree, if you become unconscious while on top of the tree while climbing, you fall down, you have serious injuries or death. If you are swimming, you become unconscious, the chances are very grave. If you are driving a car alone and you become suddenly unconscious, you hit the traffic and there is an accident. So that is for the individual. Some of the people who might have developed an epilepsy are also involved in a profession which is responsible for many people. You are driving or using a machinery, a machine or a big tool in a factory where you are near a big wheel, you become unconscious, you fall on the wheel and you are crushed. So these are the things a person for his safety will not do. The doctor has to ban these activities for a certain period of time. There are other activities for which the person is not only responsible for himself or herself, but is also responsible for the community. A driver, a bus driver, a truck driver, a railway driver and a pilot. They are also responsible for the welfare of many other people. So these jobs also will not be entertained. So the moment a person's diagnosis of epilepsy has come in, for the individual, if he is not a professional driver, not a pilot or not a person who drives a train, they will be shifted out from their profession for a sufficient period of time till the doctors think that the chances of epilepsy 
recurrence is high for a pilot or for a railway road driver this ban is lifelong and that varies from country to country there is a regulations by the government of that particular country the doctor also does not have anything they are supposed to report to the appropriate authority and they will these people will be grounded from those appropriate jobs then the next important thing is the anti epileptic drugs anti epileptic drugs are the main stay to control the epilepsy these are not disease modifying agents but they do control the epileptic seizures to the extent that there would be no seizures as long as the patient is on a optimum dose of responsive drugs that is the most important thing that you have to consider and till the ep epilepsy continues the person has to continue with this drug earlier most of these drugs produced drowsiness lack of intellect and other side effects but the newer drugs most of them do not produce that much of drowsiness and impaired intellect and the side effects are also lesser at the cost of they are being more expensive so this is the balance you have to do with these drugs so the aids or the anti epileptic drugs should be considered when risk of a seizure recurrence is high that is two or more seizures whenever it is present we have to put the person and a prolonged interseizure interval may de deter some patients and physicians to start so this justification for starting anti epileptic drugs is little difficult and it has to take the consent of the patient the attendants as well as the firm decision of the doctor who is treating treatment decisions to be shared with the patient otherwise what will happen is you start the medicine he or she will take it for one or two months and after that they will forget which recurrences and catastrophic side effects we have a wide range and how do they act they act by increasing the inhibition of neurotransmission in the brain because the epilepsy occurs because of increased excitability of the neurons for whatever reason and a reduced threshold here these drugs will increase the inhibition of neurotransmissions inside the brain and that will prevent abnormal transmission impulses and how do you start these drugs full control is usually achieved with a single drug in majority of the patients so in majority of the patients you will find that they will be taking only one drug at an optimum dose and the drug regime should be kept as simple as possible in the sense that if you have to give two or more drugs you have you should try to keep them combined in one single tablet so that the compliance is good or you can give them long acting drugs so that they can take only one tablet a day instead of taking in four or five tablets every day which is sometimes very disturbing for the individual this is a rough outline of how the drugs are being spread out type of epilepsy it can be a focal onset or focal onset with secondary generalization of into a ztcs the second row is generalized tonic tonic seizure or ztcs third variety is a absence type of seizures which are basically generalized seizures without the tonic clonic phase and the last variety are the myoclonics without the tonic phases we divide the groups of drugs into the first line drug that is the drug with which you will start the second line drug and the third line drug as you proceed in your medical career you will find that there has been lots of interchanges between the first line to second line to third line drugs a drug which was a first line drug 10 years back now goes and being shelved into the third line and sometimes vice versa depending upon the development of newer drugs or detection of more side effects in these existing drugs so if you keep on changing this classification you should be aware of one thing even today the medical profession is also not very sure what drug to use specifically for which type and in what doses so this is all a trial and error method if you open up your textbook the recent one and one 10 years earlier 
you will find a lot of changes in this first, second and third line of drugs. Lamotrigine was not there 10 years earlier. You had carbamazepine, you had sodium valproate, you had phenytoin, which were first line drugs 20 years from now. Even before that, sodium valproate was not there at all. You had drugs like phenobarbitone as a first line drug. Now this has gone to a third line. Now how do you start these drugs? You start with the lowest dose of the first drug, climb up to the maximum tolerable dose or the dose at which the side effect starts in. If after that the person still continues with seizures, you start with a second drug from the same group. Start with the lowest dose, keep on climbing up to the maximum tolerable or at the point when there are still seizures. The third option would be go to a second line drug. Start with the minimal, keep on climbing. If that also fails, you may have to go for combination drugs. So combination drug is not the first option. It is usually at the third or the fourth option that you go for a combination drug. And these are the drugs that the, which are commonly given. Focal, it is a lomotrizin. Generalized tonic tonic seizure, it is levetiracetam or sodium valproate. Ethosuximide for absence seizure has been there for a long, long time. Maybe for last 30, 40 years, it has been there when we were students also. Ethosuximide was prescribed for absence seizures. And sodium valproate is a drug which is giving you a pan cover. If you just observe sodium valproate, it is a first line drug for two of these. It is the second line drug for absence seizure. Earlier it was also a first line drug. And it is also a second line drug for focal seizure with secondary generalization. So empirical drug one is sodium valproate, which can be given to almost all categories without much worry. These drugs have side effects. We will not go into the details of the side effects, but one should know what the, the side effects are. Some of them will produce rash, blood dyscrasia like reduction in the cell counts, gum hypertrophy with phenytoin, generalized lymphadenopathy, hirsutism, etc. So these are some of the side effects that you might find with many of these drugs. How to monitor the therapy? In US, they are very strict and enthusiastic in going for the blood levels of these drugs. In India, we rarely go for drug level monitoring except in some of the epical centers in, as a research tool. In UK, which we follow, they are also not very keen to monitor the drug serum levels except under certain reasons. So epilepsy care should not be confused with serum level monitoring. This is the statement that I would like to put in here. That means you don't try to treat the person by simply monitoring the levels. If the person is controlled well with a drug or two drugs without any events, no side effects, let it continue. Newer drugs have more unpredictable pharmacokinetics than the older ones. The only indication for measuring serum level is if there is a doubt about the adherence, you are thinking the person is taking the medication and at the same time you are finding that there are seizures. He tells you, promises that he has taken the drug. Then under those circumstances, if you have a suspicion, you may have to go for a drug blood testing. Blood levels should be interpreted carefully and those changes made to treat the patient rather than to bring down the level of the level of the drug in the blood. The same thing goes for treating hypertension. You don't treat the column of mercury. You treat a patient suffering from blood pressure. Similarly here, you treat the patient with epilepsy, even if the therapeutic does not reach the therapeutic range, but the person is controlled with that particular drug. Don't try to increase the dose. Let it continue. So this is more empirical than putting it in more analytical form of treatment. 
Some hospitals would advocate serum level monitoring during pregnancy, especially for drug like lamotrigine. Without, although that does not have much of evidence, these are some of the higher centers. Under those circumstances, you may switch over to a drug which is old, time tested, and without much side effects like phenobarbitone, if you are much worried about the side effects of a particular drug. Now, if the person does not respond to the optimal drug treatment, you have given the first line drug, second drug of the first line, went on to the second line drug, first one or the second one, added another drug, but still the person is not responding properly, you have verified and confirmed that the adherence of the person is good. You have also confirmed that the person does not have anything else other than epilepsy for this particular disorder. Then you consider surgery. It is not that the person coming with pain in the right iliac fossa and you send him to a surgeon. Or it is not that a person has come with a colis fracture and you send him to an orthopedician. Here the surgery is the last option. Earlier surgeries were more of destructions, as I said for Parkinsonism, but now it is more of stimulations. So one is surgical resection of epileptogenic brain tissue, vagal nerve stimulation, deep brain stimulation or DBS, which we do for Parkinsonism. Patients who continue to have seizures in spite of appropriate drug treatment should be considered for surgical treatment, not otherwise. The planning for surgery requires specialist assessment and investigation to identify the site of seizure onset and the dispensability of any target areas of resection, whether the area of the brain involved is necessary for a critical function such as a vision or a motor function. So this is important. If you are planning for a surgery but you find that the area of focus of the epilepsy is in a very vital area of the brain like the visual cortex or the motor cortex for the hand. So in that case you should he be hesitant to carry out the surgery. What will happen is the person's epilepsy may be cured but he remains a totally hemiplegic person or he remains blind. So which one you would go for? Uh, an occasional seizure which normal functioning of the other parts of the brain or no seizure probably which gross disability as a result of the surgery. So this balance has to be discussed with the patient and with a team of doctors. So this is very important. You should not be scalpel happy to go on for the surgery. This is also to be put in, in a very important manner. Now this is another set of problems that we will discuss now. Supposing the person has been controlled adequately with drugs, either uh, one drug most commonly or at the most two drugs. Surgery has not, question of surgery has not arisen at all. Now, how long are you going to continue with the anti-epileptic drug? How long? Because these drugs will have side effects. You cannot continue indefinitely. It is not like hypertension or diabetes where you have to continue some form of therapy lifelong because the metabolic abnormality has set in and will continue. Here the neuronal dysfunction or the overexcitability would cease after some time without knowing how. So when will you stop or think of withdrawing the treatment? If the person has been not having seizure for more than two years with the drug, with the optimum drug, if the person is not having any seizures, that is one, you will think of withdrawing the drug Childhood onset epilepsy, particularly the classic absence seizures, which has got a very good prognosis, if they are without seizures for two years, yes. Other seizures like the juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which has got tendency for recur, we will not consider that for withdrawal. Focal epilepsies that have started in adult life with some structural abnormalities in the brain, you will not think of withdrawing the drug, you will continue lifelong. Overall, the recurrence rate after withdrawal drug depends upon the individual's epilepsy history. What was the pattern? If the pattern of the epilepsy was a mild variety 
coming in very infrequently controlled with one drug the outcome after withdrawal of the drug also will be good if the person was having recurrent seizures before treatment was started now responding to two or more drugs with second line of drugs with the highest possible amount of drug then the chances of seizure free life without any drugs would be unlikely patients would be should be advised about the risk of recurrence because you cannot give a guarantee that after the drug has been withdrawn after 6 months or 1 year the episode of epilepsy has started once again so they have to take a joint decision with you and the withdrawal should be done slowly tapering or reducing the dose gradually over weeks and months and with precautions for the occupation as well as the driving for some occupations like a professional truck driver a pilot for an instance even if you withdraw the drug he is not going to fly the plane again you will not take a chance of the person becoming unconscious for a very short while also while with a full load of passengers in the flight that you are not going to do but for other professions a teacher a person who is having who swims as a hobby yes you can ask them to avoid those things for another 6 months after you have totally withdrawn the drug you wait and see that seizure has not recurred let him have a swim which somebody nearby let him bicycle in the field first instead of going to the street you can gradually motivate or a person which has occupation or even driving this driving regulations are varying for country to country so the book or the doctor cannot give that advice it will depend upon the regulation set in by the authority that allows the permit driving permit so for that you require special interaction with the particular team of professionals you can only give your advice you cannot go beyond that overall what is the outcome in epilepsy what happens to these people do they die or they become crippled 50% are seizure free without any seizures and without drugs in the past 5 years that means if you follow a person who has been under medical care with seizure 20 years back and now if you find him and talk with him and ask him hello how are you 50% of them would say that i am without drugs and i am without fever the seizure for the last 5 years that quite good another 20% mute them mute them mute all of them they are talking i don't know let me once they talk they will find out yes another 20% are seizure free for previous 5 years but they are still on drugs that means another 20% if you ask them at, at the end of 20 years they will say that no for the last 5 years i am without seizures but i am still on a drug and the remaining 30% in spite of anti epileptic therapy are having seizures so this is the outcome so if there are 10 patients with epilepsy given treatment at the end of 20 years you ask five of them have not taken any medicines for last 5 years and they are okay another 20% or two of them would say that i am not having seizures for 5 years but i am on the medications and the remaining three would say that no in spite of having medicines i am still having some seizures so that is the pattern of these people after 20 years so it is not totally dark but it is not also totally pleasant earlier epilepsy was one reason for claiming or applying for a divorce not today today a person cannot claim for divorce because of epilepsy what is status epilepticus status epilepticus is a seizure that keeps on continuing for a long time seizure activity which is not resolved spontaneously like the ztcs that we have described will last for 30 seconds plus 2 minutes plus another 10 minutes that is around 12.5 minutes 
Depilepsy is gone. Contraction for 30 seconds, then convulsions for another two minutes and then lying flat unconscious for another 10 minutes. Then the person recovers. So within 15 minutes he is totally recovering. But here, if the person does not recover and the seizures keeps on continuing with no recovery of consciousness in between, we call it status epilepticus. It can occur in any of the variants of epilepsy, starting from generalized tonic-clonic, it can occur in any of the focal seizures, it can occur in absent seizures, it can occur in the partial complex or partial simple seizures as we described them earlier. But it has to continue for a long time, then only we will say that the person has got a status epilepticus. Diagnosis is usually clinical on the description of prolonged rigidity or tonic movements or loss of awareness. For the epilepsies which do not have a contraction or loss of consciousness, it is difficult to diagnose status because if the person remains conscious, you will not or do not have the convulsions, you would not know what he or she is having. Now, if the person has a status, respiration is not there for a long time, leading to cyanosis and asphyxia and acidosis. There is increased metabolism and destruction of muscles, leading to high temperature or pyrexia and sweating. And complications like aspiration, hypotension, cardiac arrhythmias because of electrolyte imbalances, hepatic and renal failure are also prone in these particular individuals. So you have to think about these issues while you are thinking about status epilepticus. How do we approach status epilepticus? If a person has got a pre-existing epilepsy, non-epilepsy, the most <coughs> likely cause is because of not taking the drug or reduction in the dose of the drug. Like a person who has gained weight as a result of aging. A 10 year old child has become now 20 years but is still continuing with the same dose of the drug. That is one problem. Sometimes a status epilepticus may be the initial diagnosis. How does it come about? By some precipitating factors like infection malignancies or metabolic derangement like hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, hypocalcemia. The convulsive types of status epilepticus are very easy to diagnose like the ZTCS, but the non-convulsive patterns may be difficult to diagnose because you don't know, you, you will look for which parameter to say that the person has been continuing with her seizure. This may be altered awareness, delirium or there might be automatism also. The person may have automatism and keep on wandering from here to there. In the, e, in the ICU setting, easy monitoring helps you to find out whether a person has got a status epilepticus and the treatment can be optimized. But most of the time, a person with a status epilepticus will not start the epilepsy in the ICU, rather he will be shifted to the ICU. So the treatment in the initial parts will be based mainly on your clinical judgment. What do you do initially? Like in any emergency situation. So initial treatment is like in any emergency in the hospital. You maintain an airway which is patterned, give oxygen to prevent cerebral hypoxia, check the vitals, pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rate, quickly go for taking IV line. From the IV line you do two things. One, you draw the blood. Secondly, through the same cannula you can put in the IV fluid and the medications that would be required intravenous. So what are the tests you will send for? Glucose for hypoglycemia, urea creatinine for renal failure, electrolytes, if possible drug monitoring, CBC, ESR, coagulation and store one sample for drug analysis. So by the time you do these things, it is almost five minutes. So these are the first line drugs. Midazolam, 10 milligram, Bacali or Nasally, Lorazepam, 4 milligram IV or Diazepam, either IV or Pyrectally, 10 milligram. Repeat any of these drugs after five minutes if the seizure still continues. 
you correct the metabolic abnormality especially hypoglycemia give 25 percent glucose if the sugar is on the lower side always give it a person with hyperglycemia is not catastrophic but hypoglycemia is life-saving okay next if the seizure is more than 30 minutes, first 15 minutes, you observe for another 15 minutes, no more repetition of the drug. You continue with the IV infusion. Now you start with either phenytoin or phosphenytoin, 15 milligram per kg, sodium valproate, phenobarbital, and monitor for a neurological cardiac functions, pulse oximetry, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and the ABZ. These are the things to be done. ABZ only once, and the monitor itself will keep on monitoring the other parameters. If the seizure continues for more than this period of time, that means by the time it is already half an hour to one hour, you now have to put the person on general anesthesia. So shift them to the ICU and intubate. Intubate, ventilate, and think of putting the person under general anesthesia because the moment you put on general anesthesia you will have to put muscle relaxants and start monitoring the person so once you monitor the person the person's status will be reverted after a period of time and once everything is under control you commence with long-term anti-epileptic drugs once again initially intravenously and then orally Sodium valproate, phenytoin, carbamazepine, or whatever drug you would prefer in the long term. And try to investigate the reason why the status has occurred. Whether it was a known epilepsy with reduction in the doses, whether something had precipitated like infection of the brain, metabolic abnormalities, or whether it is a de novo epilepsy presenting for the first time as status epilepticus. So that's all for today. In the next class, we will go to some other chapter of the central nervous system. Thank you. Thank you sir.